And it's wonderful to be back. It's two years since I've been here. And the landscape has grown in and made, it does make the building feel like it's always been here. There are moments where I think it's a ruin from another civilization. <laughs> so I want to tell you tonight about the evolution of the design for Crystal Bridges, how we came to what we came. And that would also mean a journey through other museums I've done before and after Crystal Bridges. And in a sense, there's a purpose here beyond just telling you the story, which is, I think, by showing you several museums, which are in different places, in different contexts, different programs, I'll be able to tell you something about the more fundamental principles of architecture that guide my work. Uh, because there's more to it than just individual designs. There's a thread. And the thread is a set of values and principles um, that guide you as you design. And, you know, architecture in some ways, you would say, has never had it so good. It, you know, we're making it into the magazines and, uh, you know, 30 years ago, who knew what architecture is? So at the same time, it's become a very permissive profession uh, with all the weight I put behind the word. Um, and so the question is, what are the principles that should be guiding architects? So uh, there's a few, before I show you any individual projects, I'd like to talk about some of those so we can look for these as we are reviewing the projects. And I would begin by saying, one of my principles is that design is very specific. It's site-specific, it's project-specific, it's people-specific, it's cultural-specific. You can't just conceive of something and, uh, you know, conceive it for Boston and, and then uh, parachute it into Jerusalem because Jerusalem isn't Boston and Arkansas isn't Boston and Northwest Arkansas is in Little Rock. I mean, there is real specificity, uh, not to mention site and what the purpose of a building is. And so all of this comes into play. Also, architecture is about materials, about building. It's not painting, it's not sculpture. It's often mistaken lately for sculpture. Most ar many architects are mistaking it for sculpture, but as Frank Lloyd Wright told us, it's all in the nature of materials. It's a, it's a nature of materials that tell you what you can and what's appropriate to build. We have two examples here, both ends of the pond. One is Fuller, who talked about getting the most for the least. And that's a technological material statement. How do you take materials and get the most out of them? And Frank Lloyd Wright, who, who talked about how you understand the very nature. And uh, Louis Kahn, who said, what does a brick want to be? Well, the brick wants to be an arch. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so my own term for that is, how do you design a building that is inherently buildable? Uh, inherently buildable means that it is a natural way of building that particular uh, set of building, uh, of, of uh, structures. And also, in this day and age, you can't talk about architecture without talking about resources, because it matters how much energy is consumed. It matters how much material is used. Uh, it matters how sustainable a building is. And so all this has to do with economy of means. That is the fundamental principle. If a building does not demonstrate its economy of means, I think it's kind of uh, misses the point. And then I come also to the notion of program. Actually, I was walking up intern here walked over to me and says, can I ask you a few questions? And I said, please do. And he said, how, how do you figure it all out? Do you think first of the forms? 
And, and I said, well, I wouldn't know what forms to think about. Uh, no, I can't start with the forms. There's too many forms to choose from. Uh, you feel the sight has all kinds of secrets encoded into it. And then you think of the spaces that are appropriate. If you're doing a school, it should be a wonderful place for learning. Uh, you need to kind of figure out, uh, as Khan said, what does a building want to be? Uh, and you've got to figure out how you're going to build it. And out of all that, are we having trouble with the mic? Hmm? You want to put that in? OK. Working now? Yes? OK. And so form evolves. It's not invented. And it certainly doesn't come first. I can. So I've got. Let's. So I'm going to tell you a little story in sequence. Um, and I'm going to go back to Alice's story. Uh, and you'll hear my side of it. So one day, I get a phone call from the president of the Skirball Center. And he said, you ought to know that Alice Walton was here incognito, uh, <laughs> walking around, walking around. And we heard that she's talking about building a museum in Arkansas. And he said, uh, actually, it seems that she visited the Huntington Library. And she talked to them about the fact that she wanted to make a museum that was not just a museum, but it's a place of community. And it has all the kinds of programming for young and older and, and every aspect of every, every fa facet of society. And, uh, and they sent her to the Skirball. They said, why don't you should go to the Skirball? Well, Skirball is a project I've been working on for 20 years, 25 years. We began with the first phase. And it's the Skirball Cultural Center. It's also a museum. And so since this was Alice's first introduction to my work, I think we should start with it, because there was a site. And the site had all the clues about it. First of all, you should know it was a garbage dump. And therefore, the museum bought it very cheaply. And it's along the Sepulveda Boulevard, which is along the uh, San Diego Expressway. So there's a, a, a sea of traffic uh, in front of it. And it's tucked into the Santa Monica Hills. Up on top of the hills is the Getty Museum. And at the bottom, tucked into the mountain, is the Skirball. And we didn't have the same budget. <laughs> so Skirball is a series of pavilions which fit into the mountain. They like follow the contours. And there were lots of California problems. There was fire hazard. You had to separate it from the brush. There were mudslides. It was on an earthquake fault. It had the whole set of issues. And so the building started evolving in a way to try and address that. But what I'm going to emphasize today, I'm not going to tell you the story of the entire design, but just one aspect of it, which is, that I think, what caught Alice's eye. Because it fits into the land. It, it kind of understands the relationship between architecture and land. It's about landscape, outdoor spaces, and indoor spaces. As much of the life of the museum occurs outdoors as indoors. Um, and it is a museum. It has galleries. It has changing exhibitions. It's got a very successful children's uh, exhibition of Noah's Ark, a life-size part of the ark. And as the kids emerge, they find a rainbow and a promise that life will be good. Um, 
It's got programs, busing, school kids from all over Los Angeles, which the Skirball funds itself. And they come by the thousands. It's got amphitheaters, programming. This is one of the four activity halls, uh, which serves for dinners and banquets, but it transforms into a theater and a concert hall. And there's another hall which then becomes again a place for events, and there'll be three, four events at night. This is one of our principal courtyards that is tucked into the hill, and it's transformed. It's a restaurant, but it becomes a stage for concerts at other times, and so it's a place full of life. So uh, I then heard that Alice went to visit the Peabody Essex Museum. And that was nearby, near Boston, and I would have actually gone to meet her, but I was in Singapore at the time, or somewhere far. Uh, but shortly after the phone call came, and Alice said, will you come to Arkansas? What, it, what was my first move after that phone call, after we scheduled? I went to visit the Walmart store. <laughs> It turned out that wasn't that important, but I thought I co should cover it. <laughs> so we walked the site, and we walked down, by the way, another site, uh, further down on the other side of the highway, and uh, talked about architecture. And I, I use this slide when I present Crystal Bridges showing where the museum is on the family estate, and uh, I show, I say, that's downtown Bentonville, and people are shocked. They say the museum is bigger than downtown. And I said, <laughs> well... <laughs> so, uh, that is the site, but, uh, and that's the stream coming out of Crystal Bridges, which you all know. And I will, I'm sure, I will show a few images of the building, which is, of course, unnecessary when you're in the building, but just to talk about some of the design that evolved. But we did start in the, in the in, in, we didn't start considering the, the stream bed for the building. We first thought that the hilltop was a natural place to build like always, on top of the hill. And so here was the program as a museum, uh, sort of above the hill, uh, as you come down the road today, actually would be where the trails are today. And we did realize that we'd be cutting hundreds of mature trees uh, and, and many beautiful old pines. And it just seemed like it wasn't quite right. And so then I started thinking of the mill towns of Arkansas and other parts of the country where they went to the valley because that's where power was from water. And, uh, and we visited the wonderful family house of Faye Jones just up the stream. And I found the house to be inspiring. I've always admired Faye Jones' work, but I hadn't seen any of it in person. I visited the chapel and I visited the house. And I was struck by the fact that Faye Jones had dammed the stream and created this wonderful pond around which the house was organized. I said, well, if Faye Jones can do it, I can do it. <laughs> and uh, this was my first sketch. Uh, two dams across, creating two bodies of water about 12 feet apart in level. Um, and we ordered a survey of the site, and then, of course, ponds fit into the natural contours of the land. So here's a sketch showing exactly what happens when we build two dams, the, the extent of the pond, and that was the beginning. So there was a pond. We had a mini pond above, which now just drains right into the pond below, and that would allow you to organize a series of pavilions 
around the water. Well, what could be more captivating and sort of organizing? And actually, once you have an idea like that, the building designs itself almost. Uh, it actually starts following a particular logic. That's a response to the question of earlier today. That's when form begins to take place. You have an idea about the site. And I thought, well, if we're going to build around the pond and two sides of the pond, then let's not have bridges. Let's have buildings which are bridges. And hence, uh, the bridges which form the galleries and the restaurant uh, and, and the social spaces and that was one of the early sketches showing two buildings bridging the pond and other, and other buildings clustering around it. And it's pretty close to where we okay, ended up. I gotta, I gotta take that <laughs> so. He did a sketch of a napkin that I've never forgotten. He did what is here. In one day, he saw it all. So it's it's one of the most amazing things. I'm sorry to butt in, Moshi, but <laughs> but 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 telling telling people that it happens in one day short changes how hard it is to build a building for the <laughs> audience. And then came many other ideas, that we would build it with Arkansas wood, but in a very sophisticated way of using wood. This is Arkansas pine made into laminated beams, which is the most advanced technological ways of using wood, even for big spans. And by the way, this is fireproof, much more than a steel building. I mean, heavy wood is a very resilient material. And we would build it out of concrete, but then we had this extra touch. We would, where the concrete is tied, and you have all these holes, we would inlay it with wood. And so then you get this combination of wood, concrete, and wood. Very simple structure. Of course, then we have to convince contractors that they can build with concrete. <laughs> and we won't say anything about them tonight. <laughs> And then came the bridge buildings, which I thought of as a big structure that is literally a bridge with cables spanning from one side of the water to the other. And within them, a secondary structure like galleries where you can control the light and get exactly the light level you want. Uh, and so you can, have, you can have lots of light and then control the light and sort of you're moving through a whole series of light levels. But actually, these structures are very sophisticated. We had one of the great engineers in the world think through the cables, the attachments, the glazing. Um, and once the contractor got to do the mock-up, they believed us that it's possible. So the, the, the pallet is the concrete, the wood inlay. And then you come to the museum, and it's an understatement. It, it doesn't, on point of arrival, even reveal itself. And nothing is more wonderful in, ar in architecture, I think, when you downplay the building, and then you discover it, you descend into it. And this is out of date, because with a Louise Bourgeois, it's a much better space, so <laughs> the, the, the installation of the Bourgeois piece in the center. And so the rest you know, uh, and how it unfolds. Uh, Alice and I made a number of very important trips during the design process. It's really important to learn what others have done. Um, and we went to a museum in Denmark that's called Louisiana in Copenhagen, outside Copenhagen, which is sort of set in nature uh, on the seashore. And it's a series of pavilions, and you go from one to the other, and you see nature in between the different galleries. We actually came back and made changes in the plan, where the little nook around here where you see the kind of drainage path coming through the building, and other spots where you come from one building to the other, open up to nature again. So it's always a sequence of nature, art, nature, art. So the, the beautiful light, even 
uh, even perfect light for art that you can get within the galleries as it's filtered and softened coming from the wood structure above and the contemporary galleries and so on. And here again, these moments where you connect with what's around you. It orients you, it relieves you, it makes it much more digestible in terms of experience. Not, nothing is worse than a giant museum where you're going on and on. Uh, half an hour after you started, you have no idea where you are. You're disoriented. It's like being in an airport, which is the other kind of <laughs> building designed to confuse. So now I want to backtrack to my first museum. And um, this is the National Gallery of Canada, which is a very large museum. It's, it's as large as a Met in New York. Um, it was designed in the mid-80s. Uh, and I had just come, I had just completed a series of buildings in Jerusalem struggling with the question of how do you build in a historic city. Um, the, the, it, the problem was always defined as do you do contemporary buildings or do you do reproductions of, of the historic buildings, eclectic buildings? And, and, and the architecture profession was an either or proposition. Um, and so you had these situations of historic cities with glass and steel buildings dumped into the middle of them that looked like they landed from another planet, uh, or buildings that just mimicked the old architecture but didn't seem authentic at all. And in Jerusalem, when actually I had a commission to do a rabbinical college, uh, and the rabbi sort of in a threatening voice asked me, will you do a modern building for us or a traditional building for us? And I didn't know quite which way the wind is going. <laughs> I gave him a rabbinical answer. I said, if I succeed, you won't be able to answer the question. <laughs> Which became a kind of a motto, and uh, <laughs> then uh, fast forward to Ottawa. Ottawa isn't uh, as old as Jerusalem, but it is a neo-Gothic town. It has the Houses of Parliament and the cathedral, which you see on the left side. Across the river, which is symbolically the province of Quebec, across the river is French-speaking. This side of the river is English-speaking, and the government of Prime Minister Trudeau decided to build one museum on the English side, the National Gallery, and the Museum of Civilization, which you see across the water, on the French-speaking side, thus preventing Canada from separating. <laughs> the power of museums. Um, so uh, this was loaded with all the questions of museum design as well as architect contemporary architecture its relationship to the site, its relationship, uh, um, it's, 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 is it possible to make a museum that large and keep it humane and intimate and break it up and be able to orient yourself at any time? Uh, what's the message of a museum like that in terms of the public? Is it aloof? Is it inviting? Is it a seductive place? Uh, all these things came up in discussion. Um, so uh, here is the beginning of the story, which is we've got the Library of Parliament, which you see on the right side, and on the left side, our site, and next to it is the Cathedral of Ottawa. And I decided to try and have a dialogue with the Gothic architecture, but do so in completely contemporary means of, of materials and structure. So in a sense, there's this building which is, has the Gothic spirit, but it's, it's crystal. It's, it's glass and it's concrete. Uh, and it, uh, it recognizes its surrounding by engaging them in dialogue. And then the plan evolved, and I'd, I'd just like again to touch on some principles of museum design. Uh, on, the, on the left is a very traditional classical museum design. This happens to be the museum of Schinkel, the classicist architect in Germany, and that's the Berlin Museum of the turn of the 19th century. 
And like most museums at the time, the public space was a central rotunda, like the National Gallery in Washington, the Pope Building. And the galleries surrounded it, and they turned, uh, it, the city was kind of uh, faced with blank walls or colonnades. And you see here, the, not the plan, but the axonometric of the plan of the National Gallery in Ottawa, where the public spaces, that is the entry pavilion, the long promenade arcade that leads up to the Great Hall, are on the outside of the building, and the galleries are wrapped within it. So the result is that all the public life in the building is exposed to the city, rather than the blank galleries, which usually have very few windows. So I, said, I, I, I say that here we invented the inversion of the museum from its 19th century introvert form to its 21st century extrovert form. And you see that here in a little more detail, that everything happening in the building, the movement and so on, is exposed to the city. And there are a series of courtyards as well around which the galleries are organized, so you always have a sense of where you are. So this is the openness of the building and its descent into the landscape and the places for events at the entrance. And then I recognize one more thing that in retrospect was almost prophetic. We said that the Great Hall, which we named the Great Hall, it was actually in the program called the Foyer that's suitable for uh, uh, exhibit inaugurations and receptions. We said, no, 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 this has to be a great hall. This is the National Museum in the capital. It's going to be the place for heads of state to celebrate. It's going to be a place where the great hall can really become the place of celebration of the city. And because we wanted to, to enter low by the city streets, and the great view was at the opposite end, we connected them with a ramp that was uh, 250 feet long, sloping gently at 5%. So there it is in full use uh, last year. Last year, that sounds like it was a century ago. <laughs> with a red carpet. And I wonder, would I feel so proud of it if it was today? But that's another story. <laughs> I'm getting applause in Arkansas of my eye. <laughs> and that's a great hall, and there have been amazing events in it, concerts and dinners and so on. It transforms. There's a shading system that comes in and out as the sun, as it needs to be shaded. And actually, people like it so much, they never withdraw them anymore. And these are the garden courtyards, which are places for contemplation and so on and so forth. So you break down the scale. You create streets and promenades that tell you where you are. Uh, you have reference points so that a big building can be, uh, can be comprehensible. Uh, that same courtyard has a space where the children come in through the group entrance and they can see the building through the water. And then came the question of daylight. Now, daylight is a big subject in museums, and I am uh, I am a fanatic about daylight. I think that daylight is the sustenance of life. I think that to build office buildings where half the build people work in inside offices is inhuman and irresponsible. I think that all workspaces should have daylight. I think to spend eight hours in a space that's cut off from daylight where you don't know what the weather is like is just wrong. And I think that art, most art, is experienced best with daylight even if it has to be controlled, because we recognize the conservation issues. But here we even had a political issue. The building is a two-story museum. Upstairs are the American and European galleries. Downstairs are the Canadian galleries. And nor normally museums had daylight on the upper floor and no light at the lower floor, like most 19th century museums had skylights above, nothing below. But how were we going to have the Canadian galleries without light while the American and European collection had daylight above? <laughs> so we had to invent something. And this is the 
which we invented it, which is to create uh, six foot wide shafts which come from the upper floor through and they're lined with mirror, with mylar mirrors, and they carry 90% of the light, 90% of the light to the galleries below. So the light quality below and above is almost identical. So this would have been the, this was actually the first museum to have universal daylight in every gallery on both levels, but nobody believed it. So we spent half a million dollars, today it would be more, building a life-size mock-up. <laughs> People thought that I built a church in the suburbs of Ottawa. <laughs> and uh, the light was just amazing. This is the upper level gallery with its Barnett Newman uh, on axis and with a, with a light coming from above. This is a Baroque gallery at the lower level with the daylight coming. And this is a contemporary gallery, which is another system of bringing lights for different collection. There were different gallery designs. So you can see the amount of light. I mean, this is obviously a, a red room, but uh, uh, coming to every level of the building. So I'm going to shift to uh, a series of other museums that, that came mostly after Crystal Bridges. And this, the, the children's memorial at Yad Vashem, I did actually in the 70s. I designed it in the 70s. It is a memorial to the children that perished in the Holocaust. And it was to be something that the visitors come after they've been to the main historic museum. And I was asked to do a museum relating to the children. And so for a few months, I spent in the archives of Yad Vashem looking at objects, clothing, paintings, letters. And I came to the conclusion that at the end of a historic museum where you're saturated with information, you would come to another museum and see more information. You just won't take it in. And so I made a counter proposal. This is a natural cave on the site of Yad Vashem to descend into it below ground. And there, I proposed, would be an anteroom with some photographs of the children who died in the Holocaust, and that you would move on to a room that had a single candle. Actually, the chamber is about as big as this room. In the center is one candle, and it's surrounded by a series of glass walls that are partially mirror and partially semi-mirror. And, it, it and the floor is mirror, and the ceiling is mirror, and you walk through on a bridge and that one candle reflects into infinity, millions of candles. And you walk through the candles, uh, and then you emerge to light and to life. So the design was shelved uh, because the committee said people will misunderstand. This, I should say, was before Maya Lin did the, the Vietnam Memorial, which kind of achieved success for an abstract memorial. Uh, and they said, oh, they'll think it's a discotheque. They'll, they'll just <laughs> won't work. And it was 10 years later that a, a family who lost their son at Auschwitz saw the model. With its, it had that flickering light within it, and they could see the effect. And they said, oh, you have to build that, wrote a check. And as things go, when checks are written, things get built. <laughs> and and it, was, it was, I can't use the word success for something so deeply emotional, but it certainly uh, did more than expected in terms of people uh, being moved. Uh, and then uh, switch over. One day I'm in Israel on one of my trips for the projects, and I have a call from the foreign ministry that the premier prime minister of the state of Punjab in India is visiting. They took him to Yad Vashem. They took him to the Children's Memorial. And he was deeply moved. He wants to meet the architect. Uh, it's the only other story that sort of comes close to my, my experience with Alice. Uh, and this is the Prime Minister of Punjab. Uh, as you will hear from the story, he still is although for a while he wasn't the Prime Minister of Punjab. He was surrounded by four bodyguards with their machine guns. And he said, 
uh, we, the Sikh people, have suffered a great deal. We have a rich history. We want to build a museum to tell our people our story. And this really moved me. Please design our national museum. And you're sitting in Jerusalem and saying, is this for real? Uh, but two weeks later, I was in, in India at their invitation. They took me first to the, to the Golden Temple in Amritsar, which is the holiest place for the Sikhs. And then they took me to this small town of about uh, 15,000 people, uh, where the last guru wrote the scriptures of the Sikhs. Uh, he was the 10th guru. And there, they wanted to build this National Museum. Uh, and they had a site very far, but then I proposed, uh, I have this habit of proposing sites. Uh, I proposed I actually build it on the two escarpments right next to the town, so people could walk to it and cross the valley with a bridge so there would be both sides of the valley. And you'd think there'd be public hearings and it'll take five years to, to purchase the land, but as, as things go in India, two weeks later they said we got the land. Uh, I thought about context here, and I was thinking of the fortress cities of India. This is in, the, in Rajasthan, because this town where we were to do the museum was a fortress town that uh, Guru Govind uh, lost his life at the end uh, as uh, the Sikhs were persecuted um, by, uh, by, the, by the Muslims at the time. And so there was something about this fortress architecture that struck with, and these are sketches I made on the, on the way back home of just growing the building out of the sand escarpment. Up at the corner on the left, you can see my memory of the fortress town and sort of the kind of uh, trying to relate it and, and building it with, with stone and rock and give it that, that sense. And that's the model I brought back uh, two months later uh, for presentation, the, the valley would become a water gardens in the Sikh tradition. Part of the program on the left side connects to the town, auditoria, library, etc., and the museum of the historic uh, narrative is on the right side, uh, and it's connected by a pedestrian bridge. And uh, then they had a groundbreaking, and uh, half a million Sikhs showed up. But it's an important context because when the premier came back from Jerusalem and I said, I have an architect, there was an uproar. Uh, the architect said, why not a competition? You should have a Sikh architect. And others said, what does this uh, Canadian, Israeli, American Jew know about Sikhism? <laughs> and I knew very little to start with, although I know quite a bit today. Um, and then I came back several months later, we were doing design drawings, and the bridge was built. <laughs> it's true. Another ceremony. But there it is, finished, took 10 years. Now, as life goes on, uh, four years after we started, there was an election. And the prime minister was voted out. Uh, a Congress party member, a Maharaja actually, was elected as premier. And he was convinced by his advisors that this is, uh, that he could embarrass his predecessor by saying this is a project that should be dismantled. It's a waste of public money. Uh, there was some talk about converting it to a hospital. Uh, but I had the good fortune to meet him and talk to him and go to the site with him. And we got funded and actually completed the building under his administration. And then he lost the election. And the first one came back to cut the ribbon. <laughs> the roofs are stainless steel to reflect the light. Lay of foothills behind uh, the water pond, a gawalier stone uh, applied over the concrete, and pretty nice. Well, 
And uh, they call that the flower building. And that's kind of, as you approach the museum from the north, it really is fortress-like. And these are some of the exhibit spaces, and they are coping with the issue of 6,000 people a day. We've had to add service spaces, and you can see how the exhibits and the building and the people merge. Uh, this is from the old town, seeing the, the museum, and that's during the inauguration ceremonies. Then, back to Yad Vashem, uh, as this building was being completed, the Yad Vashem decided they have to rebuild completely the historic museum. Uh, several reasons. One is Washington became by far more comprehensive. A lot of information came out of the Soviet, defunct Soviet Union that was not at Yad Vashem. Moreover, they were designed for 300, 400,000 people a year, and they were now dealing with two, three million. So a, a new museum, but uh, unlike India, which said, come do it for us, even though I'd done by then the Children's Memorial, there was a three-stage international competition. They really, we all had to sweat it out and do alternative schemes. This is the hill upon which the old historic museum is. This structure is part of the old museum, and on the right side, just off the picture, is the Children's Memorial. And I felt that I did not want to add a new big building on top of this quite amazing mountain. It's part of the mountain of memory and the, and the National Cemetery. And so I thought, how are we going to put a building that's three times the size of the existing museum and, and not build on top of the hill? And so I started thinking of coming into the mountain from one side, doing the whole museum underground, and coming out on the other side. So these were some of the early sketches. The mountain, come in one end, come out the other end, and the museum disappears underground. I also thought that that way I could avoid designing a building with galleries, all of which you do in museums, but there, to tell the story of the Holocaust seemed, seemed inappropriate because it almost had to be unarchitectural. And, you know, I somehow started, as I started thinking underground, I started looking at underground spaces. This is a stone quarry in Spain. Light comes from above as they cut the shafts through, but what could be better kind of space for the galleries than this, which is uh, a, a place that sort of not of architecture, but of geology. And uh, so again, fast forward, as the building evolved, there's this prism that cuts through the mountain. There's a line of light, which is a skylight that follows that path. But the galleries are actually on either side. These boxes you see coming out of the hill, which is now covered with trees again, uh, are, are the light shafts lighting the galleries below. So you can see that you come at one end, there's a reception building, you come in one end at the bottom, and you walk through and then you zigzag through the rooms. And you have no choice but to follow the narrative until you come to the opposite end. And so that's the reception building where soft light kind of creates a mood uh, through the trellis kind of separating you from the day to day. You cross this bridge to enter uh, over the landscape, and then there's a kind of a tunnel, and you just see the light at the end, but it's a long path, and the floor actually descends into the earth at 5% slope. And then as you move forward, you find these obstacles, these, these channels cut through the floor that force you left and right through the exhibit. And so you see the destination, but you can't get to it, without following the narrative. That's one of these exhibits. These are books from the great book burning in Berlin of, 19, of 1939. And then you move into these chambers, which are where the narrative unfolds. And always light coming from above, reminding you that you're getting deeper and deeper in the earth. And there's moments where the exhibits and the architecture, are in, which are inseparable, 
uh, become inseparable with the audience itself, with the visitors, where, where there's just this merging. And as you come towards the end, there's the Hall of Names, where all the files of the three million names that are known of victims are on, on display or in, in storage. And so we created the space where there are photographs from those files rising into the light. The files themselves you see surrounding us in this uh, cylinder. And deep into the earth, this is looking up into this cone of, ne of faces. And that looking down, there's a shaft into the bedrock right onto the water table, which is for the three million names we will never know. And then you emerge to light, and life prevailed. And very controversial, uh, six month debate. Is it appropriate? And why should architecture have the last word? And isn't it too optimistic? I said, well, here we are. We're alive. Is I mean. <laughs> and it's very exuberant as it bursts out from the mountain. And this is reinforced concrete, post tension to sort of cantilever out. So I won't end up with museums because it's, it's an incomplete story in terms of my own interest and commitments. Uh, because museums allow you to deal with culture, with community. They, I, I, call, I think museums and public libraries, they're kind of the living rooms of the community. That is where a community comes together. Uh, but I'm also being deeply interested from the beginning of my life as an architect in, in housing, in urbanism, in how we deal with mega cities, mega scale, mega density. Um, and you know, beginning with my first building, Habitat, it's all been about how do you humanize mega scale. Uh, I talked about architectural principles before, but one thing I didn't say is what is the order of the day? Each era uh, in architecture needs to deal with the problem of the day. Uh, the problem of the day is mega cities. The problem of the day is densities and the dehumanization that we are experiencing every day. It's hard to kind of, you know, you you come land into uh, Bentonville Airport and you you know you there's acres of suburban uh, single-family development. It's very hard to make a case for it here, but believe me, you fly over Shanghai or Hong Kong or Sao Paulo or Cairo or any one of the mega cities, which is today a good part of humanity, and the density is totally overwhelming. And with this also comes the issue of the public realm. Uh, we've been through malls. Uh, they seem to be behind us uh, in the sense that they, have no, they are ceasing to become, and that's very interesting, to be in many cities the social places that they used to be. Uh, We've lost in many cities streets and piazzas and all the traditional urban places. And so I'm going to show you one project because it's relevant that while I was doing Crystal Bridges, we won a competition for Marina Bay Sands. And what could be more different than this project in terms of the problem, the scale, the issues, uh, than, than Crystal Bridges? And here you are as an architect dealing with this two ends of the spectrum of what architecture is all about. Um, and I'm not going to go into the details of it. It's a project about hotels and convention centers and shopping and, and the public realm because the government of Singapore, who created the opportunity for a private developer, insisted that there'd be a waterfront promenade that it would be animated with people, that every public place would be open to the public truly, uh, and at the same time, so that this is not an introvert mall that says, let's get the people in and let, let's make it so confusing they'll never find a way out, which is the philosophy <laughs> of most developers. I'd say mall philosophy is let's create a maze. You get in and God help you get out. <laughs> So I'll just touch a little bit, you know, there are, there are shopping streets, you can, galleries, they're full of daylight, 
They connect to the outdoors throughout. It's outdoor, indoor. There are great public piazzas along the war where thousands of people gather every night. Uh, there's water shows and events. Uh, it's multi-use. There's a museum, the building at the end, which my client, when I proposed it to him first, called it a bunch of bananas. <laughs> he now calls it the ha hand of welcome, which is an improvement. Uh, the hotel, Atria, are open to the public 24 hours and they connect and they go through. And the building is covered with plant life. And we've got a big public park, private and public outdoor space on the roof on the 59th floor. Swimming pools, jogging paths. I mean, there are ways to build densely, and this is very dense and create amenities and, and open spaces and integrate landscape and do all the things we crave for without compromising the density. And this is the most successful project financially in the world. This project makes $100 million a month. And I know it has a casino and people say, oh yes, you got a casino, but it's not the casino only, although that helps. It's, it's all the other things, convention and, 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 and theaters and, and convention and so on. So it, it, it does demonstrate that you can have responsible design and have it commercially uh, effective. Just a sense of the scale of that sky park. I like long swims, so I actually did it for selfish reasons. <laughs> I, remember, I remember having arguments at the time. It, it doesn't make sense because Asians don't like swimming. You should go there at 6 in the morning, and there's about, I'd say, 3,000 people taking uh, selfies. <laughs> <laughs> and we were required to produce a cultural building on the promontory. And uh, since Singapore is well endowed with every kind of museum and aquarium and so on you could think of, uh, I proposed to invent something new, which I call the Art Science Museum, bringing art and science into a single museum. And actually, I actually have to say they've risen to the occasion. There's amazing exhibits about how art and science connect and it's now become a destination which is really very rewarding. And so, in conclusion, I'd like to go back to the initial premise, which is, again, a question you get asked a lot, not by interns, but by journalists. What inspires you as an architect? Tell us, what gave you the inspiration? Um, and I think they expect, first of all, a list of all the architects you admire, and of course there are architects you learn a great deal from. You know, one of them is on display here. Actually, two of the architects I've learned a great deal from, Wright and Fuller, without any coordination, happen to be on the site. That's very nice. 